um, today, there's no slides. We've got something else going on, uh, and I'm going to be stepping through the text of Psalm 8. So I invite you to take those pew Bibles out, those little blue Bibles in front of you, if you didn't bring your own or it's not on your phone, um, and turn to page 455, because that's where Psalm 8 is going to be found, all right? And, um, and while you're turning there, I want to begin by uh, opening with a story. It's an origin story. We all have origin stories, right? Um, and the origin story of my faith that I used to tell all the time was the night that the gospel was clearly explained to me. It was a hot night in a now closed Kmart parking lot. It was a classic tent revival scene like only the South can really pull off. And I understood in that moment, on that night, how much God loved me. I understood there was nothing that was ever going to separate me from that love of God. There was nothing I could ever do that would prevent God from continuing to love me. All was forgiven. Man, that story has never lost its power for me. It is a story that still fills my lungs up every morning and allows me to look out upon the world and see the glory of God's name all around me. That's an origin story. But I've realized in the last couple of decades, I guess, that maybe the origin story of my faith started earlier than that night in the Kmart parking lot. It started, in fact, when I was about eight years old. And it was another hot day, <laughs> because I grew up in Florida, and what can I say? That's the way it rolled down there. <laughs> but this time, it was around dusk. And I'd been outside all day. I'd gotten a new bike, and I was riding it all over my dad's property, about 40 acres. And I had checked out all the new anthills, and I'd stuck my stick down all the new gopher holes. And, you know, I'd done all the regular business, you know, of <laughs> taking care of things. And I was exhausted and hot and sweaty, and I, I laid in this field. And the sun was just setting. And the wind started to pick up. And the pine trees, moved by the wind, just went from one to the next to the next to the next. There was this tremble, you know, that went from the, the pine needles. It, and I sat there, laid there, and thought, those things are talking. It was kind of like this Morse code of arbors, you know. They were all talking one to another, and I listened, for in my memory, what might have been 15, 20 minutes. I didn't have any religious language at the time. I didn't grow up in a religious home. I, I didn't have the language that this psalmist had of Psalm 8. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the world. I didn't have that. I didn't have that language of Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God and all creation is shouting for joy. I didn't have that. I didn't have the language of Isaiah 56. The trees will clap their hands with joy. I was just a kid. <laughs> but there was something in that moment that flooded me with this deep realization that there is a community of creation out there. That it's all speaking to us. That those pine trees were talking to somebody. <laughs> Maybe the stakes are high on any given topic, you know, from Sunday to Sunday, because we come in here and we, we listen for a word from the Lord and we listen for a word of forgiveness we listen for a word of hope and a word of, of comfort, and every week we do this, and we come in with all of our various stuff. So I get it. Every Sunday, the bar can be high for us individually. But maybe for me, today feels like one of those Sundays where it's particularly acute. acute. Because in this moment, when the oceans and the skies and the creatures, and the critters, when the trees and the birds are all trying to tell us something. 
in every way they know how. In the melting ice flows, in the dying bird populations, in the spontaneous fires in the Amazon, our world is trying to tell us we are dying here. We are being crushed under the weight of your consumption, your diets, your fashion, your travel, your comforts, your systems, your energy needs. We can't sustain your lifestyles. We can't keep up with your desires. We can't replenish ourselves quickly enough. Believe us when we tell you we are dying. <laughs> For the rest of this sermon, there's going to be these film clips playing behind me here on this screen. And they're going to try to show what I'm talking about. And, and if you want to just watch the screen and tune me out, that is A-OK. -okay. <laughs> Because there's a lot of ways of experiencing, I think, what this psalmist is trying to tell us in Psalm 8 and what our planet is trying to tell us all around us. So enter into this wonder of God's creation, whatever way you, know, you feel led to enter into it today. I'm not here this morning to prove global warming or the veracity of warming seas or dying coral reefs. I'm not about to bury you in the overwhelming conclusions found by 97% of the scientists that human behavior is behind our environmental situation. You can easily and readily find those facts from pretty much any source other than the Oval Office and Fox News. But I will say it's worth noting, because this was a headline to me, that it's worth noting that the GOP is the only major political party in the world that is not addressing global warming. And that's easy to find out too. I'm here this morning to explore with you how this system that we've corporately created, all of us together, and our own daily choices, how they have cut us off from some of the most beautiful and sensual openings to God. How they have divorced us from this grand invitation that the psalmist knew so well. How they've moved us away from understanding this, this beauty and this creativity and this wonder and this love of God for us and for this planet. As I said, our text today comes from Psalm 8. And I love that beginning, that beginning sentence. It, this version will say, Our Lord, O Lord, our sovereign. But I memorize it as, O Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. And it's so easy to breeze past that first opening verse because we see it so frequently, right? It becomes just a little bit hackneyed. But think about what the psalmist is saying. He looks out and he sees this planet around him and he, he realizes this sky, these flowers, these mountains, that lake, they're telling me something about you. This is your name I look out and see all around me. These are your fingerprints. I know that. I know who's behind all this. How majestic is your name? Your identity, your, your name is beautiful in all the earth. And if we had sufficient time, like all day, we could just stop right there on that sentence. And we could unpack that your name. And we could think about where we've seen your name, oh God. And we could just unpack the third commandment. How we are not to take the Lord's name in vain and we could stop right there. <laughs> and we could begin to imagine that maybe that commandment is talking about more than just our frivolous verbal speech. That maybe that commandment, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, might mean about a relationship to this planet all around us. How we take God's name in vain, maybe often, in ways that have little to do with our speech. But we're not going to do that. We're going to stick right with Psalm 8. 
And we're going to consider the next few lines. You have set your glory in the heavens. And we're going to wonder, did the writer intend to tell us that even this beautiful globe of a planet, that even that is too small to contain your glory? That from this little beautiful orb in the cosmos, that it shoots out to all the galaxies. That your glory is, is just too big to be contained here. The earth alone is simply too insufficient to the universe and beyond, says Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> and maybe, maybe that's what the psalmist is saying there too. And then from that great clap of overhead glory, the writer goes on to the smallest, the most vulnerable of life, to infants, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark. Infants, sucklings, life that is so new, so young that they have to depend on the milk of their mothers. This verse is kind of hard to understand and it's hard to get a good interpretation of that verse. But let me just propose this. That there is this, the psalmist saw this source of divine strength, this glimpse of wisdom in these suckling babes and little Liam in the back. <laughs> that God or the psalmist saw that that helplessness, that vulnerability, that openness of the most vulnerable was powerful. It was something that could cut through maybe the fog of adult power and the systems of the powerful. Because the cries of an infant in the middle of the night really have a way of focusing you, doesn't, don't they? Nothing else is really important except attending to the need of that crying infant. <laughs> the vulnerable arouse something important and true in us. And I think there's a reason then why Jesus then, in the temple, in Matthew 21, this is a verse he's going to quote. Interesting, isn't it? After he turns over the tables, after he, he moves in and defi decisively overturns a system of greed that, that was in the house of the Lord, he then uses this verse. The blind come to him, the lame come to him, the people come to him. And he affirms them. He, he affirms, he uses this verse to silence his enemies and his accusers. He silences those out there by the voices of those who have the least amount of power and the least amount of strength and the least amount of resources. I thought about this verse and Jesus using it in the temple. When I saw the headlines this past week, Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg, does that name land with any of us? The 16-year-old Swedish activist? She's held millions around the world, many of them young people, by her message that now is the time, Friday, the same day that the iPhone 9000 came out. <laughs> Just 11, <laughs> but, but some of the largest demonstrations in the world were held on that same day, mobilized by a 16-year-old, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark for your strength. In light of this splendor all around us, the psalmist goes under wonder. When I look at the heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you're mindful of us? Gosh, don't you love that? Standing there looking at all this, his mouth agape. This is so incredible. Why me? Why did you create me? You've made me a little lower than the angels. You've crowned me with, with honor and dignity. Why? Why have you put me on this stage of the world and yourself above and, and these, the oxen and the, and the birds and the creatures of the deep, but, but beneath me, what, what is my role here? 
Many an interpretation will focus on the utter domination that humanity has over the creatures, and they'll use this verse to prove that. That root word of domination, mashal, it has the instinct of ruling. And some will claim that it is our God-given right to do with creation whatever we want to do with it. In my meditation group this summer, it's, I'll talk about that later. In my meditation group this summer, this woman um, who was in Ontario, uh, and I, 20 of us are on the phone call, on this conference call, and I mentioned the UN report that one million species are going extinct. And another woman in Canada shrugged and said, well, that's all part of God's plan. On Thursday of this past week, you may have seen that recent report on the birds. Did you see that? Yeah, the total bird population of North America, it's declined by 3 billion birds since 1970. That's a 30% decline in the total bird population. An unprecedented crisis, scientists were saying. You know, this psalmist knew better. He places this glory, this amazing thing of who we are, he places it a little lower from God, a little higher than the ox. And I get the feeling he knows what's being asked of him. That he's part of this community of creation. That this is all knitted together here. That, and he's amazed by it. <laughs> that this earth is the Lord's. And there's something distinct about our job in this place. Something wondrous about our job in this place. His life is to treat it with all the wonder and all the respect that God has already given to this creation. God has invested love here. And it feels to me the opening and the closing with the wonder of God's name and this amazement that I'm here too and I'm part of these oxen and these birds and these rivers and these mountains. It's all part of a family. And I got a special role to play. I know a lot of you are watching this video. I don't know if we've gotten to the part where the seal is stuck in the plastic ring. Yeah. Have you seen the pictures of the, the trash dump in Manila, Payatas? My daughter and I were there, some of you will remember, way back in April of 2013. And we stayed with people who lived in the shadow of that dump. A side of it had collapsed a few years earlier, and there was a plaque with the names of the hundreds who had been buried literally in the trash. Many of them were scavengers who were crushed in the muddy landslide. And we sat there and we spoke with a woman, uh, a woman from the Breath of Life Church, which given the circumstance, the name alone was really a powerful declaration of hope. <laughs> that woman pushed to have the government do something about that landfill. At least the peace that bordered their little community. She pushed them to do something to get this trash off the backs of the poor. Because what we know, if we stop to consider, is that all of our stuff, our stuff, right? Our garbage. The Starbucks cup I drank from this morning. The diapers of last night. The old plastic water bottles, yesterday's diapers, it doesn't go away. <laughs> it doesn't go away. It doesn't disappear when streets and sand comes. It stays around, right? Those old phones, useless iPhone 3, you know, they, they, they go somewhere. It lives on that floating seven-mile island of trash in the Pacific, that plastic that's found in the deepest section of the Mariana Trench, the dumps on the poor of the world. Dang. Shame on us, huh? Shame on us. Shame on us. 
for the products we consume without a second thought. All these things that we consume go on to consume somebody else. Sea turtles and seals and sparrows, yes, and people too. And I, there's a reason the Koch brothers' petroleum refining plant was down on the far south side in a largely Hispanic area. There's a reason it was the water of Flint, Michigan that was infected with lead with a 41% poverty rate and a 26,000 median income. No, there's a, there's a reason these things sit on the backs of the poor while most of us can go right on with our day. When the vulnerable cried out to the psalmist in Psalm 8, he heard them as a call. He heard the cry of the defenseless as a cry of God's glory rising up. But today we look for ways to snuff them out, quiet them down, get them off. Wow, dear ones, if, you're, if you feel sick to your stomach, I do too. And if you feel like running away from this, I do too. And if you feel like you wish there was some way we could just wave a wand and make it all go away, I do too. I do too. I'm reading this new book called Inconspicuous, Inconspicuous Consumption, The Environmental Impact You Didn't Know You Had. <laughs> that isn't helping me out. <laughs> it is not a, an uplifting book. <laughs> Because whoever thought about the relationship between our internet use and the growing demand for electricity? Who knew that 15% of all bandwidth on the internet at any one time is North America watching Netflix? Who knew, huh? That's crazy. Who knew that 30% of the food that we grow in the fields goes to waste in the fields and more of than of the food we purchase? The food that I have intentionally gone to the grocery store to get, I have put it in my cart, I have taken it home, I have refrigerated it, I have put the cans in my pantry, that of that food, I will personally waste roughly 400 pounds of it every year. I will throw out that eggplant that I never got around to cooking. I will throw out the rotting cauliflower head. Didn't get to it. No, that's incredible. You know, when did I last think seriously about the impact that my love of fashion, the dyes and the cotton associated with growing it has on the environment? When did I think about that? You know, in 2014, I was teaching this class in the Summer Institute at Duke um, Divinity School with a colleague and a friend, Thurman Williams, from Grace and Peace Fellowship. He has a church in St. Louis. And at the beginning of the week, um, we were getting our stuff lined up, and, and Thurman had a number of water bottles, and I, you know, plastic water bottles, and I jokingly said, hey, how about we each use one, and then we just refill them at the water fountain? And he laughed, and I laughed. And then he gently said, that's the thing with you white people. I got people dying in the streets today, and you're worried about the impact of this plastic water bottle hundreds of years in the future. That's real. That's real. Here's the thing I see more clearly now than I did in 2014. It's all connected. It's all connected. This system of disposability, it's, it's all interwoven. <laughs> The disposability I feel toward a plastic water bottle is some echo of the disposability I feel about other people. <laughs> that in the same way I write off the vulnerable seal, I can write off the vulnerable south side. That the, that the, the feeling that I have when I perceive that this earth is really here for me, <laughs> thank you very much, and me, and me alone, is kind of the way I feel about maybe our education system. Kind of the way I feel about our economic system. No, this, um, this is a woven garment that knits us all together. 
pine forest and precious preschooler. And there's something profound in all of this. Okay, so where's that hope, huh? Where's that hope? You know, um, we can't actually press the reset button. We can't do it. I've learned that too. It wouldn't be truthful to tell you that if we all go home and start recycling our newspapers, reducing our use of plastic, eating less red meat, that we're going to save the environment. No. No. Mm -mm. It's too little, too late. But if enough of us start to fall in love again with this great invitation that God has given to us, if enough of us walk outside and inhale this air and look around and see God's name all around us, we might start leaning in to the 16-year-old Greta Thunberg's message. We might join the next march in the street, maybe. We might start to talk to other people. We might start to demand more of our political leaders. We might start to demand more of the companies and the corporations, the matrix of this world. And collectively, we might slow down the pace we might buy some time for some scientists. We might afford some protection to the vulnerable. We might start to rediscover something precious to us. Because see, I think that's the real work. That's the real thing God wants to do in us. God wants us to remember how marvelous this gift of creation is for us and inviting us to it at every moment. So yeah, I think we start doing any one thing. You give the Holy Spirit an inch and she'll take a mile. She'll take a mile. She'll, she'll move in. She'll blow away the cobwebs. And she'll start to open our eyes to the glory of God all around us again. And I think in so doing, we start to fall in love a little bit more deeply with these talking pine trees, these babbling brooks, this beauty of the Lord all around us. That's what I think God really wants to do. Because God loves us and always has and always will. And all is always forgiven in the power of Jesus. You know, I was looking for a way to kind of, in Randall's language, make this sermon walk. <laughs> Jonathan's going to come up and play some, we're going to just reflect for a few minutes, but there's some cards in your bulletin. We didn't print, or sorry, in your pews, on the edge of your pews. We didn't print out too many of them, okay? Because that would have been a weird message, wouldn't it? <laughs> but we've got some, some ideas here. You know, some ideas of how maybe you want to commit as a family. Maybe you want to commit as an individual. Maybe, and, and I love the way Lucas had compiled some ideas on the back. And he starts and he ends in nature. He, just the way the psalmist did. He begins and he ends with this beauty of God all around us. So spend a few moments Consider with the Spirit the convictions or the promises or the commitments, maybe, that God is breathing upon you, and, and just listen, and, um, and let's continue in worship together. <laughs>